It has been given to some to handle the light, to mold it, to craft it, to bend it to right. By pulse and reflection, it points out the way. We learn by light, we grow by light. We sit in the dark, transfixed by its sight. And as the light flickers, our hearts respond. We can see the connections. We can feel the bonds. For as long as anyone can remember, there has been representative government in this idyllic setting that came to be known as America. The various Indian tribes would sit in council to decide the laws and governance of their people. Confederations of leaders from many tribes would meet to debate issues and cast votes. By the early 1600s, the region's tribes were ruled by Powhatan, the paramount chief. Then, in 1607, something happened that changed their lives forever. Strange-looking men from over the edge of the world had arrived in search of a better life. They called their new settlement Jamestown. In time, women and girls came as well. And very soon after that, a people from yet another land arrived in chains against their will. This was in 1619, more than a year before any other colonies were settled in America. On the foundations of this church, Virginia's first General Assembly met. The English settlers brought with them institutions and traditions of their mother country including the Magna Carta and the establishment of a parliament, including the practice of self-government, with the establishment of the General Assembly in Jamestown in 1619. They became the keepers of the flame, setting an example that all other colonies would follow, representative government of, by, and for the people. It is ironic indeed that both slavery and representative democracy would come to the new world in the same year of 1619. As farms spread farther inland, Jamestown, infested with mosquitoes and its drinking water tainted, was abandoned. And in 1699, the capital of the Virginia colony was moved here to the new settlement of Williamsburg and a new capital building for those keepers of the flame. And here, the first voices of the American Revolution were raised loud and clear. For Virginia by now was the largest, wealthiest, and most politically significant of all the American colonies. And then a gentleman from the rolling hills of Albemarle County, an 18th century keeper of the flame, entered the picture. His name was Thomas Jefferson. I was governor of Virginia during the latter part of the American Revolution. But by then, our capital had moved once more, this time to Richmond. Please observe these rapids on the James River, which prevent large ships from sailing farther up the river, particularly enemy ships, ships carrying British soldiers. Our legislators believed that the new capital would be safer, better defended, and more centrally located. Oh, Richmond was much smaller those many years ago, and one particular building used for local gatherings was the old Anglican church, known today as St. John's. Meetings such as this one in March of 1775 brought together Virginia's leading citizens, including George Washington. I too was present and was thus able to observe him from an adjoining pew. For over a century and a half, we considered ourselves as loyal English subjects, and yet for the last 10 years, the King and Parliament levied taxes upon us without our consent and increasingly restricted our rights and privileges. We were faced with a great dilemma. Take up arms and defend these rights or sit back complacently and suffer these injustices. Finally, on this occasion, it was Patrick Henry who stood boldly to proclaim our unspoken sentiments. Give me liberty! or give me death. Right. 
I finally realized if we wanted to be free to pursue our own destiny, then we must mutually pledge to each other our fortunes, our sacred honor, and our lives. The British responded with full military force, crushing our Continental Army in battle upon battle. Although General Washington and his men stood courageously to meet the enemy, these keepers of the flame were vastly outnumbered and poorly equipped. And then, in 1781, the war marched here, to Richmond. When we learned of the enemy's advance, the House of Delegates and I took to our horses and escaped. It hardly seemed possible that we could be victorious against one of the most powerful armies upon this globe. But General Washington and his troops would not accept defeat. They knew that they must keep the flame of liberty alive throughout our most darkest days. After six long years, and with the aid and support of our French allies, the American Revolution finally came to a victorious end at Yorktown. Interestingly, just a few miles east of Jamestown, where the first permanent English settlement in America was founded some 170 years earlier. Following the Revolutionary War, the young government of the Commonwealth of Virginia continued to meet in two abandoned tobacco warehouses near the Richmond Riverfront. But in 1785, construction began on a new Capitol building. It would be the first state house in America, constructed after our independence was won. And there she still stands, housing the oldest English-speaking form of representative government in the New World. Well, April! And Michael. Hi, Mr. Jefferson. I'm indeed most appreciative to be able to meet with you here today. And I understand that the two of you are involved in certain activities in the Capitol. Yes, we're here with the Model General Assembly. Excellent. Well, shall we proceed with our visit indoors? That would be great. You're really him, right? Well, I leave that decision unto your own imagination. <laughs> you know, architecture is my delight. So, in 1785, when I was asked to design our capital here in Richmond, well, I went happily to work. However, I was living in Paris at the time. Yes, I was serving as our new nation's minister to France. Why, is this the very model of the design I sent from France over 200 years ago? Yes, Mr. Jefferson, it is. Well, is it not amazing that this model still exists? It's older than the capital itself. Well, this design was inspired by ancient Greek and Roman temples. Those buildings representing the genius and taste of civilizations in which democratic and republican forms of government were first widely practiced. It looks like the government buildings in Washington. Well, as the first state house designed in our new nation, I like to think that my plans may set a standard for government buildings in Washington and throughout our union. Well. I should like to introduce you now to our Tribute Hall, there in the very heart of our capital. Ah, George Washington, our first president. April, I'm delighted that you recognize the father of our country. Do you know that before the Capitol building was built, the Virginia legislature resolved to have a very fine statue of the general right here in the halls? How do you know it looks just like General Washington? Oh, the sculptor Jean-Anton Houdon was considered the finest portrait sculptor in all of Europe. Many of us who knew the general personally all agree it is as if he is standing right here before us. Why was General Washington so admired? Well, his bold leadership throughout our American Revolution his wisdom and authority as president of the Constitutional Convention, which provided our system of government to this very day. But perhaps most importantly, he turned down the opportunity to be crowned King of America. After our defeat of the British forces, oh, many say that he could have been president for life. He well understood that the cause of liberty is far greater than any one person. And there are other presidents here too. Well, I prefer not to boast when facts may speak for themselves, but the Commonwealth of Virginia has provided our country with more presidents than any other state. In fact, of the first five presidents, four were from Virginia. He looks familiar. Yes, indeed, it is I. 
I was an unsuccessful candidate for the presidency in 1796, losing to my friend John Adams. However, I was victorious in my second attempt in 1800, and during my presidency, our nation doubled its borders with the Louisiana Purchase. And I commissioned my fellow Virginians, Meriwether Lewis and William Clark, to explore our new territories. There's my good friend, James Madison. He was chosen our fourth president. But before his presidency, he helped to pass my Virginia statute for religious freedom. And he was famous as the father of the Constitution of the United States. Then there is my other good friend and Mr. Madison's friend, James Monroe. He was elected our fifth president. He was well known for the Monroe Doctrine, ending European colonization of all American continents. My April and Michael, I am proud to say that our government today can trace its practices and procedures back to these Virginia-born presidents. They established a firm foundation to our young nation. And as America grew and prospered, four more Virginia-born presidents led our nation through the 19th century into the 20th century. William Henry Harrison, John Tyler, Zachary Taylor, and Woodrow Wilson. This room served as the Virginia House of Delegates Chamber when the Capitol was first occupied in 1788. That is a bust of my good friend, Colonel George Mason, who authored the Virginia Declaration of Rights, which serves as the foundation of our nation's Bill of Rights. In fact, the Bill of Rights became the law of the land when a vote was taken in this building and Virginia ratified the first 10 amendments of our Constitution. That was in December, 1791. You mean the freedom of religion and freedom of speech? Yes, and many other fundamental rights that all people are entitled to, such as a fair trial in a court of law. Who is that? He looks like a Roman. That is my cousin, John Marshall, the great Chief Justice of our United States. He strengthened the authority of the Supreme Court as the final judicial authority on the meaning of our Constitution. There are several Confederate leaders represented here. During the Civil War, our capital served not only as the State House of Virginia, but the home to the Confederate Congress. In fact, it was here on April 17, 1861, that Virginia leaders voted to secede from the Union, rather than to suffer a northern invasion of those southern states that had already seceded. This looks like Robert E. Lee. Did he actually stand here? Oh, yes, he did. It was here on this spot that General Robert E. Lee accepted command of all Virginia forces during the Civil War. Trusting to Almighty God and approving conscience and the aid of my fellow citizens, I will devote myself to the defense and service of my native state in whose behalf alone will I ever again draw my sword. I thought he was the leader of the entire army. Well, uh, he did not accept command of all forces throughout the Confederacy until the last months of the war. After four years of a long, terrible conflict, the South was defeated. Over 600,000 men on both sides died as a result of this bloody struggle. General Lee encouraged his troops to lay down their arms that our Union might begin to rebuild. In April of 1865, President Abraham Lincoln came to visit the capital of the defeated Confederacy, and he came right here to Capitol Square to see this remarkable building that has survived the war and which would lead the government of Virginia now through Reconstruction. Mr. Lincoln believed that as our Declaration of Independence states, all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. He believed, as I do, that includes all mankind. And women? Well, yes, and women too, April. Although in my day, uh, women did not have the right to vote, uh, nor did those who were enslaved have the right to vote. But happily, today, Virginia and the rest of our nation has moved forward that all people may be represented in our government. All citizens have the right to vote. A most terrible thing occurred here in the year 1870. After the Civil War, a portion of our Capitol building collapsed under the weight of years of neglect. 
A number of Virginians were meeting in a courtroom just above us here to learn the outcome of a bitterly contested election for mayor of Richmond, when suddenly that floor, this ceiling, gave way. Sixty-two people were killed. Two hundred and fifty were injured. Among those killed was Virginia State Senator James William Bland, one of a number of black legislators elected during Reconstruction. Senator Bland had stood boldly to fight on behalf of the voting rights of former slaves and white Confederate Army veterans. There's no question, he was a keeper of the flame. Within time, a political party known as Readjusters emerged. And I make special mention of the Readjusters because they were the first party in the history of the United States composed of whites and blacks working together as equal citizens. So, were women involved in this new political party too? No, April, I, I'm afraid not. In fact, it would not be until the early 20th century that voting rights would be extended to women. Well, many debates upon the subject were held right here in these chambers and many rallies on behalf of women's suffrage were held right here on the Capitol grounds. Oh, finally, through the successful efforts of such women as, as Lila Mead Valentine and Ida Mae Thompson, women were granted the right to vote in 1920. In fact, the first women were elected to the Virginia legislature in 1923. Michael, April, permit me to provide you an example of keepers of the flame in more modern times. In fact, someone who is very nearly your own age, April, this monument honors the civil rights movement of the 1950s and 1960s and is just behind our Capitol building. The image of the young lady you see there is one Ms. Barbara Johns. In the year 1951, Ms. Johns led her fellow students in their segregated high school in Farmville, Virginia to stage a walkout protesting the deplorable conditions in their school. The lawyers, you see, are those who valiantly took up her case. And that case, the only one ever initiated by students themselves, became one of five cases altogether known as Brown versus Board of Education. This decision of our Supreme Court eventually led to the desegregation of all public schools in America. Is it not wonderful what the efforts of a single individual can put into motion for the benefit of all people. And to think she was about our age. Now we have something to show you, Mr. Jefferson. Students like Michael and me serve as senators for the YMCA Model General Assembly. We are meeting in the Senate chamber that opened in 1906 after the East and West Wings were added to your original capital. Madam President, the third President of the United States, the Honorable Thomas Jefferson. Thank you. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Good day, sir. Good morning. Well, I cannot help but think that I was not much older than many of you uh, when I first became interested in government. In fact, I was a young man in my 20s when I was elected to the legislature of Virginia. Mr. President, we are the YMCA Model General Assembly. We are here to learn how government works and how we can make a difference in the world. Would you care to share some advice with us? Well, I've always believed when the people are well informed, they may be trusted with their government. Ladies and gentlemen, if there is one principle, it is the fact that the government is always a work in progress, perhaps never to be finished. It is as if all of us are striving to climb a, a great mountain and yet may never reach the top, and yet we must never cease climbing. To build a more perfect union, a greater freedom, a greater justice for all. And so my charge to you is never cease climbing. Never cease believing that you and so many others can and will raise the level of goodness in this nation to be a beacon light for the rest of the world. Remember, there is a charge, a debt, due of every citizen unto their nation. We are all keepers of a most sacred flame, and that flame must never, ever go out. It is the flame of liberty, for light and liberty ever go hand in hand.
The Virginia State Capitol is America's first monument to independent representative democracy. If these walls could talk, they would tell you of great glory and much sorrow, of promises fulfilled and promises delayed, of fiery debate and calm deliberation. The Capitol beckons all who visit to become part of the great American experiment in self-government. To those who would hold light in their hands, there is much to remember, to understand. In the right light, we can leave wrong behind. By the light, there is good we can know. In the light, justice can grow. This is the quest of those who become keepers of the flame.